Voters reject the Columbus school levy. So now what? From the Patel studio at WOSU at COSI, this is Columbus on the Record. Joining Mike Thompson this week, Kathy Kandiski, State House reporter for the Columbus Dispatch. Mark Niquette, Columbus reporter for Bloomberg News. Sam Gresham of Common Cause Ohio. And Marianne Sharkey, public affairs consultant. We've said all along it was a tough sell, a 24% tax increase for the scandal plagued, deeply troubled Columbus schools. Voters were not buying. In fact, they slammed the door on the salesman's face. The Columbus school levy lost by a more than two to one margin, losing 69% to 31%. Twice as many people voted against it as those who voted for it. By any measure, it was a defeat for the coalition of business and political leaders who spent more than $2 million trying to sell voters on their reform package. Mayor Coleman tried to find a silver lining. You know, and while the levy has failed, we have been successful in making education the topic of discussion in this city. When before it was left... when before it was left to only a few people in the city to deal with. Now what we have is a robust discussion about education in Columbus, and that can only be a good thing. That can only be a good thing for our young people. What I would hope is that we have a community dialogue right now about how to move forward uh, with the best interests of everybody in mind for the Columbus City Schools, for our kids, um, and, and, and for our community. Kathy Kandinsky, we'll have a robust discussion, but it was a robust defeat. What was the key, do you think? It was a pretty expensive uh, d uh, way to get a discussion started. Um, <laughs> well, I think a couple things. I think there was a lack of trust. You know, we haven't resolved the ongoing data rigging issue in the Columbus schools. That investigation is still ongoing. I think it would, help, would have helped to have had that concluded. Uh, and I think that maybe in the final weeks of the campaign, I think it was about three weeks out, when we learned that the uh, district was projecting a $51 million surplus at the end of the school year, all of a sudden there was no urgency anymore. Um, I, and, and it created some uncertainty about whether or not the funds were really needed. So I think it was just all too rushed, perhaps, uh, between the investigation and, and the financial issues that maybe weren't really as bad as, as they had talked about. Plus, it was a lot of money. $300 for every 100000 in value. It was a big ask, yeah. and it should, I should also point out that new, it was a new levy request, yeah, and new levy million. requests go down about... Uh, you know, about a third get passed every year, so they're much tougher to pass, and it was a lot, it was a big amount. You're probably going to be shocked at <laughs> my first comment, but I have to give kudos to the media. Y'all did an excellent job in explaining this thing so that people could see it for what it really was, because they had it under the, the cloak of, of the night, you know, and, and they never talked about the 24% increase. They never talked about the independent auditor. They never spoke of those things in, in their campaign literature. Y'all brought that out. Uh, lack of trust, I've been, since last spring, I said this thing was gonna have a hard time. And, and the 20, and the 800 pound gorilla in the room was 24% increase in taxes. Yeah. And nobody wanted to talk about, but it was a bad plan. That's $1,000 for a lot of homes in the city. That's, that's, what, right. that's what they were looking at, is a $1,000 tax increase. The backstory, and I don't know how y'all in the media are gonna handle this. How could corporate or Columbus have such a miscalculation. How could they make a mistake like this? Well, they, they were maybe watching what happened in Cleveland. <laughs> right. Marianne Sharkey worked on that campaign, yes, the I school did. levy campaign in Cleveland. That was a big ask. Yes, it, it included was. included charter schools. It was an even bigger ask. It was instead of nine mills as it was here, it was 15 mills in Ooh. Cleveland. And uh, it was a huge ask. But we started on this at least a year in advance. 
um, brought the teachers along, really had no um, organized opposition, got the teachers and the AFL-CIO to go door to door, ran a completely grassroots campaign. I really do believe that's the way you win levies, it's grassroots. I don't think you win them on TV or radio. I think you win them door to door. We had a lot of community meetings, and of course, Mayor Frank Jackson has, it has mayoral control. We have a different situation than you have here in Columbus. So he actually appoints the school board. So um, Mayor Frank Jackson was way out in front. It was his, say, his issue, and there was genuine reform. I don't know if there was real reform here, but there was genuine reform in the Cleveland levy. Do you think if they had, Mark, mayoral control here, which they took off the table pretty early, the mayor said he didn't want control of the schools, but that would have been, quote, real reform because the accountability would have been resting with the mayor's office. Right, but I think you're right. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure Mayor Coleman wanted that. That wasn't seem like a role he wanted to play. And I was never clear on why like Kathy said, there was a rush to get this on the ballot this year, unless there was some thought it was easier to pass this in an off-year election than in a gubernatorial year. But it seems like if they would get past the data scandal and take a little more time to build support for this, it would have a better shot. You talk about the grassroots. This ends the mayor's winning streak. He hadn't really lost an election since, I think, 2001, and that was the car rental tax. Remember, that? remember that? Remember that? Yeah. That got beat yeah. pretty badly. That was a token tax. Right. I mean, he got the, you know, he's won re-election many times. He got the income tax passed, he helped Joyce Beatty win the congressional seat. Mm -hmm. Why wasn't he able to bring it I, I, I to think better midway of the campaign, something happened. If not, people were given permission to say things that they hadn't said before. No data was out there, nothing was out there. I mean, you had the Clinville group um, come forward, you had some people on the south end, you had uh, several groups on the east side who came forward. Um, so it, w it was just a lot, it was organic organic resistance occurred. I don't know, typically in this town, I don't know who gave people permission to speak. Typically, you have to receive permission in this town to speak. <laughs> From um, Kathy? Uh, <laughs> Kathy, go ahead, Sam. <laughs> but, but speak you, freely, Sam. You, you do. I think uh, he's talking about Kathy's employer. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say anything like that. You usually have to receive permission to speak. Everybody broke the rules this time. And it was classic. Mike and I were there. I, I think you were there, too, to be in the halls of the athletic club debating the faith of Columbus. Columbus City Schools. It was a, I got a charge out of that in, in those hollow halls. This discussion is now going on. Well, it wasn't just the levy that lost. It was there was some turnover on the school board, yeah. which doesn't always happen. We had two school incumbents lose, replaced by two newcomers. Hanifa Campbell lost, Mike Wiles lost, replaced by Michael Cole, used to be a panelist on this show, and Dominic Peretti are the new members. Um, what does that say? What does that? I guess it makes sense that the levy lost and the school board lost. I think it just underscores the concern. You know, you know, we not too long ago we've been talking about data rigging that made the Columbus schools look like they were doing a lot better than than they really were. You know, that's a problem. And I think that's, you know, that's what a lot of people are thinking about as they're, you know, so what are we going to do about that? Well, I'm not sure there was enough said about what we're going to do about that. Cleveland had similar issues, of course, um, bad report card, tenants, figures, missing. Uh, but I think, I think the thing is, is that there was a certain honesty to it. I mean, Mayor Jackson just flat out admitted that, you know, we had all these issues and they were big problems and uh, we were going to fix them. The other important issue about Cleveland is there's a sunset on this levy. So in four years, he's, he's promised to come back to the voters. And if we didn't get, and if he doesn't get the job done, then they have an ability to roll back the, the levy. But you know, I don't think this is the end of the road. Yeah. You know, I mean, as you had noted in your clip, Coleman, ha I mean, there's a lot of attention and a lot of discussion about Columbus schools now, and you'll see if they parlay that into any, any new proposals. So the pro-levy side did promise a new day for the Columbus City Schools. Well, after the vote, it's really the same old day with the same problems. The data ranking investigation continues. More than half of Columbus City Schools have Ds or Fs. And we learned this week, this is some good news, I guess, that the district's enrollment is up. It stands at just more than... $51,000. So we are guaranteed to continue this discussion because this levy likely will come back. Will it be back in May, Sam, do you think? I think that would be a mistake if they tried to do it in May. And since they have a surplus that takes them out uh, to 216, 206, uh, 2016, 
I think it, it, it needs to start a process as described of door to door and involving people who were kept out of the process uh, before. With regards to Ms. Cambom, I think the thing that her, her candidacy was the scandal around her husband yeah. uh, that came out in the latter days of the campaign. Um, I think that hurt him, her. But I think any incumbent in this race was a target. Now, Mike Wiles fought against a lot of the stuff that the corporate community wanted to do, and he was like the gadfly in the ointment. But I think people, now, you ask your question, why Rias won? She's the quietest candidate of them all. Nobody knew who she was. But she got reelected. I don't, I don't, and all of them were on the Democratic sample ballot. How did people choose between Wild was on there, Cambon was on there, all of them were on there. Why did Rias win? I don't know. So what, where does the reform effort go from here? What needs to be done? Charter schools, are they no longer going to be included in this package? I, I think that's, that's dangerous at this point to even discuss that. I don't know. I think they'll have to do some research and see, really kind of drill down into what parts of the, was it, was it parts of the proposal that turned off voters? Or was it, as you know, I kind of contend it was just so rushed. And, and then, of course, once the urgency was taken away, that people just needed to know more about it. So I just think you're going to have to see a lot more community engagement, a lot more to gr a lot more grassroots, as Marianne said, and to go forward. But there's no urgency, as you noted. They're, mm -hmm. they're, the finances are okay through the year. Uh, the, I think one of the things that's in the backstory too is how much money was spent as the campaign moved on. I heard a lot of people say, "Wow." That's a lot of money. They're getting all these things in their houses and their doors, all these commercials. I think people thought it was overkill. And, you know, I, I, I learned a long time ago, a pig with lipstick on it is still a pig, uh, Miss Palin's comment, but it's still a pig. She didn't come up with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. right. but, but it was still a pig. Yeah. You, can, you, can, you can smear it with all the money you want. People wasn't, just wasn't buying it. Is there any way to satisfy everybody in one of these reforms? They had a 25-member commission. They had a cross-sample of folks from teachers, parents, business leaders, and they came up with a compromise, which didn't satisfy really anybody. It didn't win the voters over. How do you do education reform right? Well, I mean, I, I can only speak to the Cleveland case. You, you actually had the mayor leading that. I mean, the mayor ha had all the parties at the table, but at the end of the day, he will tell you, it was his proposal. He put it together. He made he made the decisions that were critical to and he it. Has over and he has control. And he has control. This was the mayor's plan. This here, was the mayor's plan. But he was going to have to hand it off. I to the I think school board. that in the end, someone has to take ownership, and uh, whether it's the mayor or the superintendent, but someone has to take ownership. Every time one wins, it's the personality that brings the people in the room. Dean Harris, for years, helped people get around the Columbus Public Schools. Um, prior to her, Hire and Etheridge and a whole bunch of people, but we turned down some levies in Hire and Etheridge uh, period. Uh, Jean, when she, Dr. Harris, when she came on board, it was a personality that everybody liked and they got behind that personality. I don't even remember in the years that the levies were passed what were the critical issues even under Jean Harris. It was simply Gene Harris. I, I did find it, Mark. I did find it interesting that all during the campaign it was, this is a coalition of everybody. We're going to fix the schools. Whether well, it was intentional or not, after it lost, it was suddenly, we don't trust the district. <laughs> did you notice that? I mean, the mayor said, didn't have anything to do with the mayor of corporate Columbus, right? <laughs> it was, it was the coalition. It wasn't us. It was the district. Well, in sort of agreement that there was a lack of trust. Yeah. And, you know, it seems like that's the first thing you have to, like, square away if you're going to go down this road. So... Uh, like Marianne said, maybe that's that's the first step in moving forward to whatever comes next. All right. The end of the 2013 campaign can only mean one thing. It's the start of the 2014 campaign. <laughs> Finally. <laughs> Voting was not even o over yet when pundits were trying to figure out how races in New Jersey, Virginia, New York City, Toledo might affect all of Ohio. Of course, the big race here is for governor with John Kasich trying to fend off a challenge by Democrat Ed Fitzgerald. Marianne Sharkey, what can we learn from any of those races? I mean, Toledo is one they're looking at because, because of the Senate independent Bill 5 issues, mayor yes. who supported Senate Bill 5 right. lost. Yes, exactly. But I still think as we look at the polling and we dig through the polling, 
John Kasich appears to have overcome most of the negatives involving Senate Bill 5. He's, he's coming up in the polls. So, so I, I'm not sure. I mean, there's no question Ed Fitzgerald, who is the county executive in, in Cuyahoga County, will continue to beat on him and will continue to, to try to rally the union troops and particular police and firefighters who often vote Republican. So he's, gonna, he's, he's going to try, try to rally them. But I, I think that Casey has pretty much overcome that issue. Um, well, the police and fire, remember, it's been two years this weekend with the I, Senate Bill 5 vote. That's, and it's going to be another year before they go to the polls. And I think it's how the Democrats shape the campaign. If they can frame and bring those issues back up again, plus the women's issues, uh, that one on the, on the back end of the budget, uh, those types of things, I, I think it could be an interesting campaign. And as Fitzgerald gets better uh, as a candidate, um, I don't see Kasich as... Is, is off the sky snide. I think I applauded and I really supported him for the Medicare, Medicaid, ca Medicaid expansion. Right. Um, but other than that, I can't think of anything that he's done since he's been there um, that really tickles my inners. I mean, he's, you know, it's all going to come down just like just about every other election to jobs and the economy. Yeah. And if the economy, you know, you can argue that the economic improvement has been very slow. And a lot of the new jobs are low-paying jobs. But if we keep moving in the right direction, I think he's going to be hard to beat. Now, one of the better issues, though, would be the Jobs Ohio issue that, you know, they can create some concern about. And that's more recent than Senate Bill 5. Um, but Kasich has done a few things that I think, w you know, will make give him some some positives amongst uh, some some more moderate voters medicaid expansion you mm -hmm. named mm -hmm. he, he's he's done a lot with mental health and social services mm -hmm. uh, as well so he's shown kind of a softer side on some of those issues um, that we haven't seen from some past republicans yeah, and i think the medicaid expansion in particular the democrats politically aren't happy about because right after the election the uh, head of the democratic governors association came out and said the 2014 election would be a referendum on a Tea Party class of governors, and it was built off what happened Tuesday with the loss of Tea Party candidates in Virginia and, and Alabama. But he wanted to lump Governor Kasich in with, you know, Scott, Walk, Scott uh, Walker, Rick Scott, some of these other governors. But, you know, the, the Medicaid issue kind of blunts the connection to the Tea Party, obviously. Mm -hmm. in, yeah. in, in Virginia, the Republican loss uh, to the Democrat by 2.5%. The Libertarian got almost 7% of the vote. Is the Kasich administration watching that number to say, look, if we get a libertarian candidate on the ballot here, it's a close election, I could use those votes rather than them voting for somebody else? Well, I, he's got to be concerned about a libertarian or even somebody on his right flank or the Tea Party. Um, there's always a concern that somebody's going to come to the right flank or the Tea Party. I can tell you that, of course, Cuyahoga County, which is a Democratic rich county, and John Kasich will not win it, but he certainly is making inroads there. Um, he's spending a lot of time, and you ask what he's doing, he's, he's opening up the Main Street Bridge, he's, uh, he's working on Opportunity Quarter, he worked with Frank Jackson on uh, school reform, he even backed the school levy in uh, Cleveland. He's, he, John Kasich is becoming, if, you don't, if he's not in Columbus, he's going to be in Cleveland. It's hard to read too much, I think, into that Virginia vote, too, because the consensus seemed to be these are two pretty bad candidates, yeah. and even the vote for the Libertarian was less of a two evil kind right. of thing. Yeah. Not a, it's like a none of the above vote. Yeah. Yeah. And how, how well funded is Fitzgerald going to be? I don't see a lot of signs that he's going to be very well funded. I think, he's, I, think that, I think that's a key, but Democrats across this state have to figure out some strategy. Uh, mm -hmm. Is redistricting their strategy? Is the governorship their strategy? What is their strategy? And I, I, I'd have to put that at the at the foot of the leadership. They got to figure out something. I don't think on the on the face of it, Fitzgerald's a bad candidate. He looks good if you can get him the right information, get him surrounded by the right people, and get him the right money. He could make a race. Now remember, the governor only won by two percentage points yeah. when he ran. Now he's running against Cordray, but he only won by two percentage Strickland. points. I well, mean, I, I, think, I think Ed Fitzgerald will have money. There's no mm -hmm. question. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I, the unions are going to come through for him. Um, mm -hmm. 
they they still do have a grudge against John Kasich, and so so the money will be flowing for Ed Fitzgerald. I mean, one of the problems Ed has in his own home county is is that he's just completing his first term as county executive, and there's a little bit of resentment about the fact that he, he you know he ran for governor while still in his first term as county executive. And you know, and he's not the, well known. And the, the rating agencies downgraded the the Cuyahoga rating for County. Cuyahoga County. Yeah, standard of poor. Oh, yeah. Rating agencies. I'm not sure how many voters really care about rating mm -hmm. agencies and the ratings and things like that, but it's just one thing that hurts his economic message, even though Standard & Poor's said the county is well run, it's just, it's still, a, it's still bad well, news. Well, part of it was they cited the loss of population, mm -hmm. which I'm, I'm not sure, you know, Ed Fitzgerald can be, you he know, blamed, responsible blamed, for that. He blamed John but the Kasich. Second, but the <laughs> second, but they did mention uh, the building of a convention center hotel by the county. And there are people who do question the wisdom of the county putting itself, putting its bond uh, issuance on the line for a, you know, basically a hotel. Um, There's kind of a weird connection to, to the 2012 presidential election. Who do you give credit to the economy? Right, if the economy, yeah. Ohio economy is doing well, doesn't that that's bode well for Cleveland or vice versa? That's is a good point. Be a problem? That's a good point. Yeah. Yes. All right, our final topic, as state officials are hard at work preparing to expand Ohio's Medicaid system to nearly 300,000 additional people, opponents are still trying to scuttle it. Ohio is expanding Medicaid thanks to the small legislative committee known as the Controlling Board. It okayed Governor Kasich's plan, even though the full legislature refused to act on it. Far-right lawmakers and anti-abortion groups are asking the state Supreme Court to rule the Controlling Board move unconstitutional. The governor does not seem too worried. I say no, it's not. It's not a bypass of the legislature? No, it's all within the rules. We're fine. We're confident. Uh, look, I don't get into lit litigation, but we think it's just fine. What do you say to those? I, I don't say any more. It's already done, and we're moving on, and we're trying to help a lot of people who, you know, I had talked to a friend of mine today who's doing jury duty in Franklin County, and uh, he says, you know, I see a lot of people who clearly have uh, problems with uh, mental illness uh, down here in the courtrooms. And, uh, you know, when I see these people, it just makes me feel so good that, that things are going to be done to help them, period. Mark Nicole, I get the feeling he's tired of talking about it, the governor is. But in the Supreme Court, vows to act quickly on this case, so we should know probably by the end of the year at the, at the latest. Yeah, and they're trying to push it quickly because by January 1st the expansion takes effect and the argument is once it takes effect it's going to be harder to undo if you decide it wasn't proper and, and it's kind of a complicated fight but it, it sort of comes down to one side arguing that this was an action against the legislative intent and the other side saying this had nothing to do with Medicaid expansion and essentially the controlling board action was just to accept federal funding from an expansion that already happened when the Medicaid director asked the federal government for the permission to expand. You know, we should point out that, that Governor Kasich's administration is not the first administration to expand Medicaid without going to legislature, doing it through an administrative action. Past governors have done the same thing. So, as you pointed out, the, the, is, the control, is, is it going to be looked at as what the controlling board did or what the governor did? But the other thing I would point out is the controlling board is the legislature. Right. You know, the legislative leaders had the ability to put people on the controlling board to vote against this if they chose to do so. The only thing that bothers me about the way this was done, it's an administrative action and does it sustain another governor? And the question becomes, how do we do that? I know there are people out in the field talking about going with the petition drive to get it enshrined somehow into the Constitution or administrative rules. So I, I, I'm teetering. I'm not sure if you want to leave this to an administrative rule where people can challenge it like this, or do the petitioners want to go forward to enshrine it in law so it doesn't get back? Because thousands of people are affected by this. Well, this, I mean, this is an age-old question. I mean, I, I was, I, you know, I covered the General Assembly in the 80s. Don't date yourself. <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> <laughs> and we always had fights all the time then about, you know, how much power, and, and is there too much power in the state controlling board? And let's face it, this was a punt from the, uh, the House Republicans. Yeah. They absolutely punted this. Yes. They did not want to make their members have to vote on this issue and then go back and face the Tea Party in the primaries. And that this flat out gave them cover. Bill Batchelder is a very wily legislator. He knew exactly what he was doing. He removed, 
you know, somebody off the bo off the controlling board, put someone on to vote yes, and then he spared his members from be from having to vote on it. Because the consensus was that it would have passed had right. it gone to a vote between right. Democrats and some more moderate Republicans. It would have passed. Had it gone to a vote in the full legislature. In the full legislature, yeah. yeah. And there was a bill now to you know to talk, con reconsider the role of the controlling board, or put limits on it, and and it's not universal. I was talking to a colleague in Michigan about this, and he said, "What controlling board?" Because in, in Michigan, you have to go to the full legislature to get yeah. these kind of everything. Approval. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, it's time now for our final off-the-record parting shots. And Marianne Sharkey, you'll go first. I would say that in the next few weeks, Ed Fitzgerald definitely is going to be picking his running mate. It's probably going to be somebody from downstate Ohio, and I suspect he's going to look for a minority. Woman? Woman would be good. Yes, woman would be good. Sam? I think Medicaid people who are out there petitioning are going to move forward because of the problems with Medicare and Medicaid expansion. I think they need, they're going to move forward. All right, Mark. We were talking about the uh, uh, election on Tuesday and what the message was, and one of the narratives was this was a backlash against the Tea Party. But it'll be interesting to see if it has any kind of moderating effect on the debt ceiling fight in January or what uh, candidates get nominated in the midterm primaries. Hey, Kathy. How soft do they go? Um, I was going to say that the Columbus School levy, 69%, 61%, whatever it was, defeat, I don't expect to see that in the next year, maybe two at this point. Uh, I think that we're not going to see another levy on the schools for a while. I have to record comment. There's a lot of talk that money can buy an election. Well, that may not be the case. They win a lot of elections. Money can help win a lot of races, but certainly there are two examples how that didn't work. Remember 2008, the casino vote, Wilmington Casino? Supporters outspent opponents two to one. And then this week, supporters outspent opponents by astronomical amounts. Both lost two to one. Supporters lost, even though they spent all that money. So money's not the only thing. Voters do have a say. That is Columbus on the Record for this week. Check us out online on Twitter, on Facebook. Every show is online at WOSU.org. For our crew and for our panel, I'm Mike Thompson. Have a good week. <laughs>